Thank you, Sue, and good evening, everybody. This time of the year, it's nice to sit by the fire and read some historical fiction. So I have saved a chapter for you. Once upon a time, a group of neophyte rock climbers rappelled down otter cliffs at Acadia to the seaweed-covered rocks below. They congratulated themselves on their first try. Then, hey guys, the tide's coming in. Quick, teach me how to climb back up. Once upon another time, Ellie Master Kilborn and President Reynolds, who was an avid sailor himself, pretty good one, decided that Bates should purchase some International 420s to be managed by the OC at Lake Auburn, but there was one caution, because the lake is the drinking water supply for Lewiston Auburn, and no swimming was allowed. The book also tells us here that, as is often true, the nicer the day, the stiffer the breeze, and strangely, none of us ever quite finished a sunny day of sailing without being tipped over by a gust. Who knew? Design flaw? Tonight's a celebration of a century of adventures. In some contexts, the outing club can seem kind of quaint, like with grainy photos and movies of ski jumping on Mount David. But in others, it's clear that the OC was way ahead of its time in equity and inclusion, in leadership development, in environmental advocacy, and it certainly changed all of our lives. The class of 71, new people in the classes of 68 to 74. We were there in the time of Vietnam, Nixon, civil rights, anti-pollution, and Bates' rapid transition from separate, gender separate dining, get this right, David, gender separate dining to co-ed dorms. And it happened pretty quickly. Economics were modest. With few cars on campus, the B and BOC might have stood for buses. Many weekends, there were multiple busloads going places with hundreds of students enjoying Maine and New England. There was always someone for whom it was all new, and there was always someone helpful who knew how. Traveling together made it easier to see that an introvert paddles as well as a groupie, a singer hikes as well as a field hockey player, a geologist skis as well as a writer, and most of us were not from the cool kids' table anyway. There is no score. There's no winner or loser, except for the Golden Sword Award. In the outing club, there's no prize to earn, no rank or competition, no grade. Different from the rest of college. But I admired those who could study in the buses on the way home. Never could. Mark Warner remembers a mountain climb to Bigelow. I think it was October 1968. We climbed to the lean-to. We were trying dehydrated food. We had a terrible time boiling the water over the fire. By the time we had eaten, it was dark and getting very cold. We did not wash the pot, but filled it with water and went to bed. In the morning, we awoke to find a frozen, dead mouse in the pot. While we slept, ice formed on everything at our elevation. It was one of the most beautiful days. Rime ice on everything up high, and the valley was just exploding with color. The Outing Club naturally produced peer leaders. On the way at Bigelow, on that truly perfect fall day, a newcomer was having troubles on her first hike, and Fritz Bushman let his friends go on ahead to the summit while he stayed back with her to bandage a blister, give a snack, and help her along. A lifelong hiker was born. By definition, all students are members, welcomed and included in everything, no questions asked. What proportion of the student body had their life's very first lobster with the BOC? Their first ski trip, their first night in the mountains, their first sunrise on an island. And all done with the encouragement of people who knew which part of the lobster to eat first. The BOC was gender balanced way ahead of its time. Leadership was six women and six men from each class with paired directors for each program. You could go from how to paddle to beginner whitewater in a weekend. The puddle jump was spontaneous, born of the sinking of a Jeep that was plowing for skating. Parts of future passions came into focus, especially environmental advocacy. After smelling the noxious Andrus Gagan on many foggy mornings, we discovered that Ed Muskie, class of 36, 
was pushing the Clean Water Act through the Senate, and we jumped in uh, to the movement. Now it's home to the world's greatest collegiate crew program and a state park. Did you learn to laugh when dinner falls in the campfire? Were you awed when somebody whispered, there's a moose? How did it feel when a new friend asked, would you help me organize this? How about we do a winter carnival with bands and snow sculptures and a formal ball and a torch run? Ray Potter says, I remember my first work trip on part of the, our 50 miles of the Appalachian Trail. I'm not sure whom I was trying to impress, but I loaded up my pack with four cans of lead paint and a bunch of hammers. It might have been more catastrophic if the trip into the lean-to was any farther than it was. As a relatively new backpacker, it was an important lesson. And meeting Red Parham of the legendary Parham family was great. I remember him wielding a chainsaw, and I remember him doing it in a white dress shirt, Ray. And the rest of us had brush hooks and buck saws and couldn't keep up. <laughs> Red hung his tea bag on a limb to dry so he could use it, reuse it tomorrow. Wendy Woodcock Mitchell became an expert in blazes, having painted the entire Bemis section. She observed that most of the old ones from the 1964 work trip were on dead trees. Craig Kennedy's team in Commons was wonderful. We thought they were generous. They thought we were saving them from cooking and dishwashing for hundreds of students. We gave them a list of the people signed up and they provided food for every trip from steaks to oatmeal. Boxes and boxes for three days and three buses in Acadia. Sandwiches. We gathered in the kitchen Friday evenings to assemble hundreds. Food literally flew across the room into paper bags. It might have been the genesis of Frisbee golf. Wendy still wonders that all the that we all survived when our rations included tuna and egg salad sandwiches made on Friday, transported without refrigeration, and not eaten until Sunday, except for ski trips. Scylla Baird Potter. Skiing at Sugarloaf one weekend, I was getting on the T-bar with Mark Warner and began to slide off. Mark reached out and hauled me up and sat me back on the chair. We were laughing like crazy, and we managed to stay on the T-bar even though everybody behind us was laughing too. Once in a while, we'd come across a pothole in the T-bar track where a body had lain and half a sandwich was left. Though a lift ticket was about $4, some skiers bent on reducing the cost per run would zoom to the lodge, grab the sandwiches, and eat on the ride back up the mountain. 16 lifts is 25 cents per. The winter of 69 was the snowiest in Maine history. People living on the first floor of Roger Bill noticed residents of upper floors flying past as their way on their way down to landing in eight feet of fluff. And devotion was amazing. OC professor and advisor Jim Boyles came from his home in the country and was on time in Dana every morning. Even our advisors are hardy, crazy, and faithful. Ivan Bass remembers Sugarloaf closing to dig out the lifts buried in snow, riding the T-bars with snow banks 10 feet deep on either side and ducking under the cable wheels. And the snow fields were open in May. He climbed into Tuckerman's to see the Inferno race, Mount Washington's summit to base, watching skiers flying over the headwall. The race has not been run since 1969, not enough snow. Jim Miller decided the annual trip to Tuckerman's would be a great opportunity to introduce the legendary Captain Trey. He of the flying ace helmet inherited from the Red Baron, chin strap flapping, showing a few dazzling runs from ever higher starting points in the ravine. Good train conditions extended down almost to Pinkham Notch. Was that the same trip Dave carried a cake to Tuckerman's for Lynn's birthday? Well, it might have been that trip, I don't remember. It was hard to transport a fresh baked cake safely in a backpack up the mountain. The can of frosting was cold and unspreadable. And I even had candles, but it was so windy we couldn't light them. 
Alas, despite all the romance of the concept, my inability to be a good boyfriend reared its ugly head. My present to her was the Psych 101 textbook. She was taking the course. I had a very lightly used one. I thought it would be useful. And it was, and still is to this day, carefully remembered as an unpopular choice. Lynn quickly replies, how did you get in this? It was a terrible choice. The psych textbook has also been, had also been discontinued in the class I was taking. Fortunately, Dave is a far better husband than he ever was a boyfriend. She actually said that. One short term, Joe Barsky and Dan Canfield repaired, refinished all those wonderful old wooden old town canoes. If you haven't paddled a wooden canoe, do so. One pop, just don't carry it very far. One pop on clam bake, the weather turned cool and rainy and numerous students stayed home. We built the fires and cooked all the steamers and lobsters anyway. What should we do? We asked each other. Joe Barsky said, we have to eat them. As Jim tells the story, he had perhaps two or three more lobsters and it was years before he could bring himself to eat lobster again. Young German professor Karl Arndt drove a sweet BMW sedan. For a great weekend of 4,000 footers on the Appalachian Trail, he eased it way up the Crocker Cirque Road over boulders, even against our better judgment. It was even slower and more painful going back down. But when he finally got to the highway, he turned and floored it. And by the bottom of the hill at Sugarloaf, we were doing 100. It's worth the effort. Before the rangers at Acadia were on to us, we started sneaking out of Blackwood's campground and sleeping on the cliffs for moonrise over the Atlantic and phenomenal stars. The OC's annual planning weekend was the advance, never a retreat. Among the things we learned is that when canoeing on a moonlit night, you can see the bottom in a pretty deep lake. Mark remembers Bauer Hardware, where we bought wooden skis with metal edges for $30. Not the worst skis he ever had. It was also the place to which seniors sent eager young frosh when the e-room had an urgent need for 100 feet of shoreline or some candy striped paint. Which brings us finally to the Golden Sword Award. Go ahead, just go to the, the, one of the old boys at the counter will know where to find it. You know, you can picture it, red and white striped. Just ask for candy striped paint. Lynn says, I only got the Golden Sword once. We were coming home from some OC trip and ran out of gas. As we pushed the car, I brilliantly suggested that we go to the second gas station rather than the first because it was cheaper there. Many groans. What? Nascent Sunday River won the sword quite publicly. It ballyhooed its big first new chair chairlift. Turned out it was too heavy to run because the safety bars were made out of solid rod rather than pipe. And they had to take off all the safety bars, 70 feet in the air. Sword. You know, the college knows that we all chose it in some measure because it sits among the great pleasures of Maine. A century ago, Bates people created a totally student-run organization to encourage everyone to enjoy the magical places. It developed in an, into an extraordinary source of personal growth, leadership development, safe opportunities to try new things, and a common denominator for friendships across every phase of campus life and a lasting influence on the careers and lives of thousands of people all over the world. Such depth and breadth and scale is unique within Bates. And it's unique to Bates. Such lessons last a lifetime, and here's evidence. Years after graduation, Casey and Linda Putnam and some friends planned to cook lobsters one afternoon at Reed State Park. At low tide, they walked out to the little rocky island and set up a pot of water on the Svay stove. It was windy, the conversation was good, and after a long time, the, only wa the water only got sort of hot. In went the lobsters for a slow death as dusk approached. Still later, a ranger with a rescue dog and a major flashlight hollered from the beach, You can't camp here! The picnickers gathered their things and waded back to the beach neck deep one holding the tepid pot of lobster water over his head. An hour later, at the roadside pull-off on Route 1, Boyle was finally established, and very mediocre crustaceans were carefully eaten while sitting on the curb in the dark. 
Okay, guys, it's your turn. What stories do you have?